everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Feel free to pop into the chat there your name and where you're joining us from. We are excited to have you here with us. As you're joining us here, feel free to pop in your name and where you're joining us from um, into the chat function. We are so excited to have you. Ah, oh, we have Barbara joining us from Maryland. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Connie from Cincinnati. Aspen in Washington. Laughing and drinking. As you're joining us here, feel free to pop in your name in the state or town you're joining us from. Um, we're so excited to have you with us. We have Vicki in California. Lois in Atlanta. Thanks for joining. Trish from Pennsylvania. Ooh, we have Barb joining us from Alberta, Canada. Awesome. <laughs> we have from Iowa, Virginia. Thank you all for coming. We're so excited to have you. Ooh, we have Martin joining us from Copenhagen, Copenhagen, Denmark. Amazing. <laughs> Martin from Florida. Thank you all for joining. So excited to have you. If you're joining us on Facebook Live too, feel free to pop into the comment section where you're joining us from. Brenda from Georgia. Beverly joining us from Boston. I'm in Boston too, so thanks for coming. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming today. My name is Marissa. I work here on our traveler support team um, with Go Ahead, and um, we're so excited to have you joining us today for our National Parks Travel Talk. We are running our tours as of the, you know, we actually have just got back from one of our National Parks tours um, right now. So we thought, what a great time to get together and, and chat through these tours. So we're going to learn a little bit about our parks today, uh, but just some housekeeping things. You know, you are joining us today on a webinar, so we can't see you, um, we can't hear you, but we would love to hear from you. So as we're going through the presentation, if you have any questions that you would like us to chat about, feel free to pop those into the Q&A box if you're joining us via Zoom, or if you're here with us on Facebook Live, feel free to pop that into the comment section as well, because we're so excited to answer your questions. Um, we did have some people pre-submit some questions too. We're definitely gonna be answering them throughout the presentation and we will have a time for Q&A at the end as well. So um, if you had some specific questions about your reservation, um, we're talking more about the national parks in general today, but feel free to reach out to our traveler support team and we would be more than happy to talk with you about your reservation and your specific questions. Um, and we will be reaching out as well for those questions that were submitted first. But yes, let's dive right on in. In. So, you know, spanning 84 million acres of the United States, our national parks are truly a beauty to behold. Boasting a diversity of landscapes seen few other places in the world, our national parks are as unique as they come. One can marvel at the geological significance and vastness of the Grand Canyon, be blown away by the power of the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone, and be awestruck by the way that light pours across the sandstone in Antelope Canyon like we can see here. From mountains to valleys, from deserts to dense forests, the national parks have something to see for anyone who wonders at the beauty of the natural world. A land rich in culture and history, venturing through the U.S. national parks takes you on a trip back in time, getting a glimpse into truly wild landscapes that far outdate humankind right here in our own country. If you love photography like I do, traveling to the national parks makes you feel like a professional regardless of your experience level, <laughs> as subjects of our photos here never fail to be stunningly perfect. So join us today as we learn more about our Western U.S. national parks and our itineraries that we do have available to help you experience this beauty firsthand, whether it's this summer or sometime in the future. 
but we know that figuring out the logistics for a trip, even within our own country, can be a bit overwhelming. But here at EF Go Ahead Tours, we take all the stress of planning a trip off of your plate. As industry experts, we know the best hotels, the best restaurants, the best sites for you to see to experience the best that each destination has to offer. We're here to support you every step of the way, providing assistance in picking the best itinerary for your interests, finding you a personalized flight itinerary to get you to tour, and providing a 24-7 on-tour support team that you can reach out to with any needs that might arise while you're on the road with us. Our unique itineraries are driven by the passion and knowledge of our local guides and our tour directors who are dedicated to carrying out Go Ahead's mission of opening the world through education. You know, we believe the best way to learn about the world is to experience it firsthand and our tour directors really bring these experiences to life for our travelers. So today we are lucky enough to be joined by one of those magnificent tour directors, Phil, who's been journeying with our travelers through the National Parks for quite some time. So Phil, thank you so much for being with us here today. Well, Marissa, it's my pleasure. I'm really glad to talk about the parks. I've been to some of these parks 75 or 80 times. Wow. I've, been, <laughs> I've been leading the national park tours for Go Ahead for, oh, this would be my 15th year. So uh, like I say, I've got a lot of knowledge, but I still get excited every time I go to one of these new parks. Even when I start talking about some of the parks, I get excited. And so hopefully some of that will be shared by you uh, who are participating in this, in this webinar. And by the way, good afternoon to everybody and good evening to Europe. Yes. <laughs> staying, awesome. staying up late to join us and that's wonderful. Thank you for doing that. We are so happy to have you all. And to get us started, we're going to do a wonderful little poll. Um, so it's going to pop up on your screen. If you don't see it in the middle of your screen right now, go ahead down to the menu bar. Um, you'll have a chance to click into it. Um, but essentially, we're asking how many national parks are there in the United States? So if you just click one of the answers and submit it, um, that will pop it on in and we will see those results in just a second. But let's see what we know. How many national parks are there within the United States? I'll just give you another minute. I won't answer because I know the answer, but. <laughs> Perfect. All righty. So, um, the answer is we have 63 different national parks. So it looks like we got, oh, about 30% of you. So it's a little bit split, not bad, not bad. <laughs> there are more in historical like national park sites than official parks, but great job, everybody. Um, yeah, so you can see kind of a map here. Um, Phil, would you wanna talk a little bit more? I know that we're focusing today right on the, the Western national parks, right? We are. In fact, if you take a look at this uh, graphic that we've got up there, there are national parks all the way out to the eastern United States, but a quite a cluster in the western United States. And I guess the reason for that is because there is so much to be seen in terms of different kinds of landscapes in the west, that everything from granite mountains uh, high mountains to sandstone to canyons to valleys and rivers and beach and so much to see in the western parks and we're going to be touching on a few of those today. Um, ones that are all part of the various national parks tours that we that we offer here at Go Ahead. So the, we're going to do it by state and the first state is going to be Colorado. I'm talking to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, this is where our uh, probably oldest national parks tour starts. It goes up to Santa Fe and then directly into Colorado. So the national park that we'll talk about first in Colorado is Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde. Mesa is Spanish for tabletop. It's a flat mountain. Verde means green. And uh, certainly is a flat mountain top. We're going to be going up to the top of the Mesa so that we can take a look at these cliff dwellings that are about 800 to nine, well, 800 to 1,000 years old. They are in remarkably good shape and they're built into alcoves. 
They were built by the people who are now, their descendants are now living in the Pueblos. Uh, Pueblo is a type of an Indian reservation. The Pueblos in New Mexico and Arizona and Colorado. Uh, but these were the ancestral Puebloan people. They're also known as the Anastasi until recently. So if you've heard the term Anastasi, that's who was responsible for building these uh, these magnificent uh, villages literally in the rocks. When you go there, you'll see Cliff Palace, you'll see Spruce Treehouse, you'll see the gorgeous canyons, and you'll also be able from the top of the mesa to look around you 360 degrees and see about 8,000 square miles of the United States. We're looking out into Colorado right now where this is a group picture that I took uh, on tour at Mesa Verde. And we're looking out to the north, that's Colorado. If you were to look to the left, that would be Utah. If you continue to turn in that direction, you'd be looking at Arizona. And if you're looking directly south, you're looking at New Mexico. So literally you can see four states from Mesa Verde. And at the top of Mesa Verde, the elevation is about I'm going to try to remember this exactly, 8,572 feet. I think that's, tr that's correct. Uh, also, on top of that mesa, you don't just have the cliff houses that are tucked into the canyons and the alcoves. You have the history of the people before they built the cliff houses. They only lived in the cliff houses for about 100 years. Before that, they lived on top of the mesa, and they were farmers. Uh, and of course they were hunters and gatherers too, but they grew corn and beans and squash and they lived in a pit house. What we're looking at here is essentially a pit house, what's left of a pit house. They would have had poles going up the side, it would have had a flat roof, they would have gone in through the top. And you'll have an expert guide uh, from Mesa Verde join us for a half day of touring the mesa and looking down at the cliff houses uh, and just marveling at, at the views. There's no place like Mesa Verde. It's the first national park in the United States to be created purely for the works of man and just not its natural beauty alone. So uh, Mesa Verde, always high on a list of places to see. About 75 miles north of Denver, and this is going into more northern Colorado, you cross the state from Mesa Verde uh, into Rocky Mountain National Park. And Rocky Mountain National Park, as you can see from this photograph, is absolutely majestic. Uh, granite mountains and alpine lakes and streams. Tundra, you'll get up into uh, the tundra country too. It's a uh, it's quite a, quite a change from Southern Colorado. And uh, even in the process of going from Denver to Rocky Mountain National Park, you'll get to see a lot of the Western landscape. And uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is always a favorite. There's a lot of wildlife you can see in Rocky Mountain National Park. And that's not just true of Rocky Mountain National Park. I mean, I have seen elk at Mesa Verde before, uh, mule, very large mule deer. Here we're looking at some Rocky, uh, some Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, and uh, there are herds of them in the national park. There's a very large elk herd also in Rocky Mountain National Park, and they're always fun to see. They're migratory, but so you never know where you're going to find them. But there's about 1,500 in that elk herd in Rocky Mountain National Park. So for those of you who like to go out there and see the flora and the fauna, there's quite a bit of fauna in the national parks. They're protected. So we'll talk about that as we go on a little bit further. The next state we're going to go to is Arizona. And I think most of you can guess what the major national park draw in Arizona is. It is and probably always will be the Grand Canyon. And uh, there's really no way to take a photograph of the Grand Canyon. I know Marissa said, you know, photography, you can go and enjoy. It, but yeah, but this is, this is this much of the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is this big. It's uh, 277 miles long if you measure by the river. 
It's up to 18 miles wide uh, and it's a mile deep. Uh, groups love going to the Grand Canyon. And especially if you've never seen it before, it's a bucket list place. And if you go there during the, during the season, the, when, the, when it, the snow's not there, you will hear languages from all over the world because this is a bucket list location, not just for Americans, but for people all over the world. And they come in and they, in, they enjoy the views. And uh, this, is, this is Mather Point. You can actually go out on Mather Point and you'll have the canyon to your left, the canyon to your right, and the canyon directly ahead of you. We're on the south rim here, We're looking over towards the north rim of the canyon. And you look at all the different colors of the rocks. That's called stratification. And there are uh, different layers that were laid down at different times because Believe it or not, even though we're at 7,000 feet of elevation now, at one time, this was actually at three times in the geological history, this area was under an inland sea that went up from Texas to Alaska and then curved off towards Hudson Bay, sort of like a big Y. And that sea laid down sediments or sands that under pressure became these rocks except at the very bottom of, uh, of the Grand Canyon, you see some rocks that are not local deposits like you're looking at here, but there's a layer of rock that goes all the way around the world. It's called Vishnu Schist. And How old is that rock, Phil, the, that deepest layer? The deepest layer, it's, I guess the easiest way to say it is 1700 million years old or 1,700,000,000 years old. And geologists just love this area. It's not just good for tourists. They study every layer. They look for fossils. They look for uh, little sea creature shells and things that are in there. And that'll, that'll tell them a lot about the weather and the climate and what was going on at certain parts uh, of, of our history as a planet. Um, so the Grand Canyon on, works on every level. Um, there's a rim trail that you can hike along the Grand Canyon. There are a couple of uh, trails accessible to you on the south rim where you can go down into the canyon. It's funny though, as you're looking across the canyon at, uh, from one of the main lodges, it doesn't look like it's that far across, maybe 10 miles. But if you're hiking it, you're going to be going up and down. So it's about a 23, 24 mile hike one way. So don't expect to hike from one rim to the other and then come back and be back in time for dinner because that's not going to happen. That definitely <laughs> sounds like an adventure. That's awesome. It's a, it's, a, it's a vigorous hike. But, you know, you have the options of you have the option of doing things at the Grand Canyon. One of the things you can do on your free day at the Grand Canyon um, and it's really, it really is an adventure. You can fly in the early morning hours over the Grand Canyon. So you're in an airplane at dawn, looking at the Grand Canyon from the air over the canyon. Then you'll go up to Page, Arizona. You'll go through Antelope Canyon. The original slide that we showed you of that slot canyon that looks like it's made out of peach barang, you know, that one is Antelope Canyon. It's absolutely stunning. And then there's a 15 mile float trip on the uh, Colorado River right through Horseshoe Bend. That's a 12 hour day. And it's uh, if you take a look, I think it's about four hundred and eighty nine dollars. You get to see the canyon from inside from the river from the sky <laughs> and also get Antelope Canyon and two and a box lunch and a box, bre box breakfast to boot. So that's a, something you should consider for your free day at the Grand Canyon. We're there a half a day before so that you'll be able to see uh, a lot of the sights of the South Rim if you sort of pack it into the, the afternoon uh, when we arrive. Definitely sounds like a must see, that's, that's great. Well, I yeah. would love to hear what are the must sees in Utah? The must sees in Utah. Well, you know, Utah is national park rich. It has five national parks. And I think after you see the some itineraries, you'll see the Grand Canyon, you'll see Zion Canyon, you'll see Bryce Canyon, you'll see all of these things. 
no two canyons that we take you to are going to be recognizably similar at all. They're all very, very different. And this is going down the road. You might recognize some of these monuments. There's, it's Monument Valley, uh, Utah, right on the Arizona-Utah border. And Monument Valley, this picture was taken just about where Forrest Gump stopped jogging. So if you remember the movie Forrest Gump, he was going down the road right here when he decided, I'm not going to do this anymore. We enter the uh, Monument Valley from this direction, and it's not a national park. A lot of people think it is. Uh, it's actually managed by the Navajo Indian tribe. It's on the Navajo Reservation. The Navajo Reservation itself is 27,000 square miles. So it covers a lot of territory. But if you take a look at the, these, if you look to the photograph on the right, the iconic picture of uh, Monument Valley has those two rock formations, the one in the middle and the one on the left. And those are called the mittens because that's what they look like. They look like two mittens that are, that are standing up there. And this is where Ansel Adams took his iconic photograph of Monument Valley. And uh, of course, John Ford made all of those Westerns uh, stagecoach uh, in Monument Valley searchers. Uh, it's, it's so recognizable that when you actually see it in person, you're just stunned because it's so much more magnificent than even you think it's going to be. Um, and again, it is, it is in high desert. Uh, we get to Monument Valley at the perfect time of day. When we get to Monument Valley, the sun is low in the western sky behind us. So for, for Marissa, when she's got her camera, this is, this is exactly magic hour. This is when you want to be there to take your pictures of Monument Valley. So, When's the best uh, time of year to go, Phil? We had some, one, Joan had submitted kind of, what's the best time of year to, to go to Monu Monument Valley? Mm -hmm. Monument Valley um, in the winter time is covered with snow. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's high desert and it's in the, on the Arizona-Utah border, but it does snow there in the winter time. Any time that you want to go um, from, I would say, mid to late spring all the way through fall and autumn, it's ideal. Uh, it's dry. The, the odds of getting rain there uh, of any significant quantity is very, very small. Uh, it's on the Navajo Reservation, so it is, it's as remote as you think it is by looking at the pictures, quite honestly. So I would say any time mid-spring to uh to late fall you should be fine thank you yeah definitely avoiding the winter sounds good we don't want to get stuck in a snowstorm though that would be great <laughs> a great thing to see for sure now what's the next closest park to to monument valley well out of monument valley we actually the way that we do the, that we do some of the tours is we go monument valley grand canyon and then grand canyon to this next park which is zion but Monument Valley, you can also go straight from Monument Valley into Zion. It's, it, it just depends on which itinerary and which tour you're talking about. But Zion National Park is one that a lot of people hadn't heard of until recently, and suddenly everybody's heard about it. It's a, it's a place that people are flocking to because as far as natural beauty goes, I, I, it's almost incomparable. When you're at the Grand Canyon, you spend your time on the rim. When you're at Zion, you spend your time on the valley floor. So the cliffs all rise above you and you're looking up at everything rather than down into everything. Uh, these beautiful uh, cliffs are red colored on the bottom. They're white colored on the top. Um, they are part of what is called the Grand Escalante Staircase, which is various layers of color in the rocks that proceed all the way from, if you want to consider uh, the Grand Canyon, from the Grand Canyon all the way up to Bryce National Park. You see all these different colors. And uh, Zion National Park is literally, you can sort of see the rock here. It's fossilized sand dunes that were thousands of feet tall. And they've been compressed into this, uh, what they call Navajo sandstone. This is a picture I took of one of the uh, 
bighorn sheep. This is a female that's out there. And sometimes coming into the park or leaving the park in the mornings, you'll be able to see individuals or small herds of these sheep. That's some of the wildlife that's at Zion. There's also wild turkeys. There's also uh, and w mule deer that come along the side. Uh, at the Grand Canyon and at Zion National Park, the California condor has been released there and they're doing extremely well. Nine and a half foot wingspans on those birds. And uh, at one time there were only 18 of those birds left. And uh, they were taken into captivity, they were bred, and then they were released, not in California, but in more remote areas where they're protected by the national parks, they're not going to be hunted. All of these national parks are wildlife preserves. So if you're interested in wildlife, the Western wildlife is very, very visible in the national parks in the West that we're talking about. Zion is probably one of my favorite parks. I've heard it described as uh, Yosemite in, in sandstone. And so if you've been to either one of those parks, you'll love the other park. <laughs> Uh, but Utah's parks, uh, this is the second, well, the first park wasn't a national park. That was Monument Valley. This is Zion National Park. And after Zion National Park, you go a little bit higher in elevation and you come to Bryce Canyon National Park. Now, Bryce Canyon National Park, if you remember what Zion looked like and how that Navajo sandstone looked, this is an hour and a half drive, totally different place. This is a place that was created at the bottom of an ancient lake bed. These sediments that came down are not from an ocean, they're from a lake. And all of these sediments built up, they're a little bit more loosely packed than Zion. So they erode differently. What we're looking at in these canyons is erosion, basically. And so these erode, and as they erode, a crack will form, that crack will widen, then you'll have a wall of, of stone, then a window, little hole will appear in the wall, then that will erode, and you end up with these pillars called hoodoos. And this is the largest concentration of those pillars. You can see them out there. Uh, this is the largest concentration of hoodoos anywhere in the world. And uh, you, you can do a rim hike here, uh, there are several different places that we stop and Marissa, again, get your camera out because it's really hard to take a bad picture of Bryce Canyon. Also at Bryce Canyon, you can get snow any month of the year because you are at, at the top of what's called the Colorado Plateau, which is a big bulge right where those four states, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah come together. There's enough volcanic activity down below to have made a big bulge. This is the very top of that bulge. That's why all this erosion is happening. But we're at a pretty high elevation. Uh, so summertime, usually the days are quite nice, uh, quite comfortable, 60s, maybe low 70s. And then maybe within hours it will be 50s <laughs> but that can... fluctuation do you have any packing tips i know what you're saying too we're going from more desert landscapes to tops of mountains what are your recommendations that's exactly the point if you're going to go out into the national parks in the western uh, western united states you've got to be prepared for high desert type weather which is cool evenings your evenings maybe get maybe get down in the 50s or depending on the time of the year, maybe even the 40s. Uh, and then the days can be up in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, then depending on elevation where you're going, that could change in the course of a single day. So what we always recommend for people coming out is to bring layers. Bring, bring something you can leave on the bus if it gets warm or you can put on if it gets cold or cool. And uh, also, it's always nice to have a little rain poncho or something that you can throw on just in case a squall comes by. And normally the rain out here doesn't last like it does back in the Midwest where I was born. Uh, you, you could rain steadily for a couple of days back there. Here, usually it, uh, 
if it starts raining, it comes down hard and fast, and it's over in a very short time. Normally, that's the rain cycle. It could be 10 or 15 minutes, or it could be an hour. Very rarely do you sort of, do you see the kind of day where you get you get steady rains. People in the West pray for steady rains. Don't get me wrong. We're in the middle of a 25 year drought out here, but nevertheless, uh, it's not that not that common to get a steady rain. Well, thank Another, you for the recommendation. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say, thank you so much for that info. It sounds so much like living in New England. Be prepared for anything. <laughs> bring your layers. Sounds perfect. But yes, there are yeah. other places in Utah that have really cool rock formations, right? The arches was one of them. This is the this is a picture of arches, and we're over by the Colorado border in the eastern part of the state now. And this is an unusual park. You recognize the sandstone as being the kind of sandstone that was made from uh, not seas depositing sediments, but you know when you have your uh, well, just like just like in Zion, you're going to have mounding up of uh, of sand that under that is compressed under pressure. If you look at, at this sandstone that's right here, this Navajo sandstone, imagine that there was sediment that went another 5,000 feet above this at one time, and it has all been eroded down. And this, this is a, a stop in uh, Arches National Park called uh, Wall Street. If you remember Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, there was a big charge of uh, horses coming up here. They filmed a lot of that in uh, the national parks, and a lot of that came from Arches National Park. This is one of our groups there. You can see we're there early in the morning, and uh, it's very common in Moab to have the blue skies and the sunny days. They're, uh, they're in the eastern part of Utah. It's a very dry part of Utah, but the soil and the, the amount of greenery that you have around there is actually surprising. The arches themselves, this arch is probably about 90 feet, 80 to 90 feet high. It's called double arch. And uh, you can see us approaching double arch, but you can't see the people that are already in double arch. Or if you can, you've got really good eyes but they look very, very small compared to the size of that arch. Not all of the arches are that big, although some of them are bigger. <laughs> and uh, there are uh, over 1,800 arches in the park. Obviously, you won't see them all, but you'll be able to see some of the, some of the major ones, and they are absolutely spectacular. Arches are all over the western United States, especially in this particular area. Arizona and Utah, New Mexico, they get arches, but this particular place is bit, it, it, it happens to be on a mile deep salt uh, formation. And the weight of the earth above turns that salt into a gel. So there are earthquakes, but they're not felt on the surface because there's this big pad of jelly, basically, in between where the earthquake starts and where the surface is. So these arches normally would be destroyed by natural phenomenon. These arches are not, and that's why there are so many of them there. And uh, this national park was hardly ever visited until about 1970. And uh, now, oh boy, if you're a mountain biker, if you're a rock climber, you know all about Moab and Arches National Park. But to get away from some of the red rocks and to get into a little bit of a different, uh, uh, different kind of landscape, we'll go to Wyoming. And uh, when we go into Wyoming, there are two national parks that are absolutely stunning. The first one, you may recognize those alpine granite mountains in the background. It's America's youngest mountain range. It's called the Grand Teton Range. It's not a long mountain range. It actually is a result of a volcano. Well, it's a geological fault uh, where there was an uplift and these mountains just got pushed up into the sky. And uh, they are absolutely gorgeous. Mountain climbers, 
uh, come out to the Grand Tetons all the time. Skiers in the wintertime, they have a lot of uh, winter sports up in Jackson, Wyoming. You'll also see bison there. You'll see elk. This is a picture I took of an elk who was sort of looking at me like, what are you doing here? Uh, but there's elk, there's what they call pronghorn. They used to call them antelope, but I think they're mostly called pronghorn there now. Grizzly bears uh, roam through the Grand Tetons and through Yellowstone. And you can tell the grizzly bears from the black bears. Sometimes black bears are pretty light brown, but uh, this one's got that hump on its shoulder and the big round head, and those are definitely grizzly bears. Uh, usually, we can see a grizzly bear or two, because uh, we, depending on how much time you spend in the parks. But the grizzly bears are pretty common. This is the Snake River uh, with, the Grand, with the Tetons in the background. It's a picture that I took on tour on a very calm day. Um, and, we, you know, we don't just go past the Tetons. We actually go very, very close to them. And uh, one of our stops there, uh, one of my favorite stops is a stop at Jenny Lake. And this is, this is Jenny Lake. And take a look at the mountain in the background and then the reflection of the mountain uh, as it uh, comes right down to our group photograph there. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. What you don't get in this photograph uh, is the smell of the forest and that everybody, they come back in and they go, it smells so fresh out there. It's, there's a pine forest and there's an alpine lake and there's beautiful mountains. And uh, this was later in the year. You'll notice everybody's wearing their, their winter gear uh, and there's snow on the mountain too. There's, there are glaciers in the Tetons. There's not too many of them left and there's, they're not the kind of glaciers that move down the mountain. There's what they call hanging glaciers or sort of in little bowls that are up there on the top. But you can see a couple of glaciers when you're uh, coming up by the Tetons. Now, Phil, you were, were talking about, you know, being in more of a mountainous landscape as we're in the Grand Tetons. Yep. What is mobility like? We've had a good number of travelers kind of submit some questions around that. So how accessible are these different parks, you know, both Jenny Lake and really all the ones that we've talked about? How are they accessibility wise? Well, particularly right here, since we're, we're looking at Jenny Lake, there is a very well-established path that goes off to the right and goes off to the left. So you can take a little bit of a walk out there and uh, enjoy the lake, just enjoy the, enjoy the forest and enjoy the trees and the mountain views. But uh, most everywhere we go, the accessibility is very good. Uh, if your mobility is not good, you don't have to take advantage of these hikes, like in the Grand Canyon. The Rim Trail is a trail that is well-worn, and so it's right on the edge of the canyon, not to the point where it's dangerous, but you can walk along the, uh, the Rim Trail, and even the South Kaibab Trail and the Bright Angel Trail going down into the canyon uh, a little ways, and those are all very, very well-established. Uh, at Bryce, there is a, uh, an opportunity to take a walk. However, that is not so well established. So if, if your mobility is not good or you're not a good hiker, at 8,500 feet, the air is kind of thin, you might just want to go along and look at all of the stops where the bus goes rather than try to walk between them. There's a lot of up and down. But the thing is your tour director knows about this. And so any place that you're gonna be going, you can ask the question, if I wanna take a hike, what will it be like? And how long will it take? How long is it gonna be? Or if I don't wanna take a hike, can I just go from one place to another and enjoy the views? And uh, usually I, at Bryce, for example, I'll have about seven or eight people that'll wanna do a two mile hike, um, but it's not necessary. We also, this year, have something new called a small group adventure tour. And that's a tour more designed for hikers because we'll get off the road and go back into several different places where you really wouldn't be able to access it, with, with, to access it without hiking. 
So uh, look for the small group adventure. If you're a hiker, definitely look for the small group adventure tours because they're the ones that uh, are fundamentally designed for you. Yeah, thank you. And that's great. I'll tell, I'll give you all some more information about that new tour towards the end of the presentation as well, but that's great. That's so it. essentially, Phil, you're saying, regardless of your, your level of comfort with mobility, the, you're still going to be able to see everything and there's different ways for everybody to engage, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And for people, for people who want to go take a hike, there are places uh, where that's absolutely easy to do. But if you're not, if your mobility is not great, then stay with the group and uh, we'll be able to take you to virtually every place that everybody else will see, but we'll do it in comfort rather than uh, do it uh, through hiking. That's great information. Thank you. Yeah. Now, what is this lake? I know we just saw Jenny Lake, but this does not look like one I would want to swim in. Ah, well, not only do you not want to swim in it, there's a big fine. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. I will not be doing that. This, this is in Yellowstone National Park, and uh, this is called Grand Prismatic Spring. Um, you'll see sort of in the middle of that picture, there's a little bit of blue where the steam is coming up. That's a hot spring that it comes up. There's another picture of it. But the color around that spring, everybody seems to say, if you ask them what they think it is, they'll say, well, that's minerals that's coming up from the soil and then being deposited on the spillway. Actually, it's algae. And algae uh, thrives in, in, this, in this water for some reason. It is mineral rich. But the algae that is, is in the hot spring is sort of a blue-green turquoise color. As you leave the hot spring and the water starts cooling down, you get that yellow algae, orange algae, red algae, and it forms a mat like a rug. And they're trying to preserve that. They don't want anybody walking on that unless you're a bison. The bison do walk on it, but they don't like people to. And it's very, very hot water, too. Uh, so but the thing is, there's boardwalks around all that area. So that's where we that's where we enjoy that kind of view. And there's what we're looking at here is Old Faithful. And uh, Old Faithful is uh, a geyser. It comes from water that is superheated below ground. And then the only way for it to escape it's like an overfull tea kettle. You know, once you get it, once you get it too hot, it's going to, the water's going to expand and it's going to shoot out the uh, mouth of the kettle. Same thing happens here and it happens right now about every 90 minutes. And so we, uh, if we get there early, we'll see one and you'll be able to walk around the geyser field. It's not the only geyser in the field. There are other geysers that are actually bigger than Old Faithful. It's just that you don't know when they're going to erupt. So you may be treated to a major eruption while you're there uh, and perhaps just enjoying Old Faithful and walking through the geyser fields. Also in Yellowstone National Park, this is an, uh, an iconic picture. This is Yellow, Lower Yellowstone Falls. The falls itself is about the size of, uh, it's off in the distance there. The falls itself is about the size of the Statue of Liberty. So it's a pretty impressive waterfall. It's on the Yellowstone River. Marissa, this is a good place for you to take your picture right there through the trees. You can frame it beautifully. And it's in a, an area called the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And uh, if you look at the, at the rock walls there, you can kind of see there's some yellowish color in there. There's ye actually Yellowstone in Yellowstone National Park. And uh, the, the river continues on past where we're standing right here and goes further down the canyon, which is an, uh, stunning colors on the cliff walls, red and uh, ochre, yellow and uh, grays that are just beautiful. I mean, it's an artist's palette of colors right there in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And the Yellowstone is full of wildlife and it's very heavily forested, 80% of the of Yellowstone is trees and 80% of those trees are, are lodgepole pine trees those very straight trees you see uh, in the uh, 
well, the foreground of the ladies taking the picture, but just past them are, are lodgepole pines. And so within those, within that environment, you'll see bison, you'll see elk that are around there. Uh, I can't promise you how many that you'll see, but uh, there are grizzly bears in there. There are some black bears, but mostly uh, grizzly bears. And again, a great place to see wildlife in Yellowstone Park. Montana. We actually go to a national park up in the northern part of Montana. It's called Glacier National Park. And it is stunning. I mean, if you liked what you saw with Rocky Mountain National Park, Glacier National Park is a little further north. It's maybe a little more of a wilderness area. This is Lake McDonald. Uh, there's a beautiful lodge right there at Lake McDonald. And then the Going to the Sun Highway uh is something that everybody should do because it is one of the best mountain rides that you'll ever experience you'll go winding through the roads past landscape like this you'll notice on the left hand side there's a cascading waterfall coming down big granite mountains a lot of greenery because they get a lot of snow in the winter time and of course the snow melt uh, just keeps everything fresh uh, beautiful, again, alpine lakes, and uh, you get to feel like you're on the top of the world when you actually get up to the crest of, uh, of Glacier National Park. The one thing that there isn't much of in Glacier National Park is glaciers. A <laughs> hundred years ago, there were, there were glaciers everywhere, but most of the glaciers have receded because of the change of climate. So uh, where it, it's still called Glacier, and there are still a few high glaciers, but it's not like you can walk up and touch a glacier anymore. Those days have, uh, have left us. But again, you've got uh, flora, fauna, and beautiful, beautiful landscape to take a picture of. And again, one of the nice things about being there is you can breathe the air. It's different. You know, it smells different. It tastes different. It's... Uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience being out there. California. California has got a bunch of uh, national parks too, but probably the most beautiful park in California and maybe even among all of them uh, is one that we will go to after we pass through Death Valley here. Death Valley, if you think about Death Valley, you probably think of the Sahara Desert. You probably think of nothing growing it's extremely hot here. It's very low elevation, uh, but you would be wrong. Death Valley is absolutely gorgeous. These are not sand dunes that you're looking at. These are mountains. And this is a view from a place called Zabriskie Point. And uh, there's another uh, place called Artist's Palette. The colors in Death Valley will surprise you. Um, and of course there is a flat land and a valley and there are sand dunes. Uh, in one little area of the valley that you can you can romp on if you wish. But uh, Death Valley has got just stunning, stunning views. And there's even a there's even an area where a stream comes out into Death Valley and evaporates away. But in that two inches of water, there is a fish that you only find in Death Valley called a pup fish. It's about two inches long. Aggressive territorial, they just, they're fighting constantly for territory because there's only about this much stream and there's only about that deep. But uh, there's more life out here than you would actually expect. And uh, Death Valley is a beautiful national park, overlooked by many, but certainly worth a visit. But this is Yosemite. It should remind you of Zion. It's got the towering cliffs. It's got waterfalls. Zion doesn't have too many waterfalls and they're not very big unless it rains and then there's waterfalls everywhere. But in uh, Yosemite, you get waterfalls that are there year round and actually <laughs> freeze during the winter time because it, does, it is high in the mountains in the Sierras and it does get cold. If you go in the spring, uh, or early summer, and there's been a good snowfall in the Sierra Mountains, there will be waterfalls everywhere you look, 
in Yosemite. And I can't even tell you where because they change from year to year. They're just called volunteers. And the snow melts and it's looking for a way to go down with gravity and whatever way it finds, that's where it will create a waterfall. And uh, Yosemite is granite. This is El Capitan. They recently made a, a documentary movie of a fellow who free climbed, that is with no ropes and no tools, free climbed El Capitan. And that is one of the most <laughs> harrowing climbs you can possibly make in, uh, in the United States. But it's not unusual to go to see, to, in the summertime, to go to El Capitan and to see people making their beds halfway up the mountain, hanging there in, uh, you know, with, uh, with ropes and, and, and uh, pitons that they have put into the wall and rolling out their sleeping bags. Uh, the Merced River goes through there and it makes beautiful meadows but if you look in the background you'll see a mountain called half dome and half dome used to be a full dome somewhere in geological time but a glacier as huge as that mountain probably bigger moved through there during a, an ice age and literally sheared off half of that dome and it's quite an amazing thing to see Again, there are black bears. You'll, there's just black bears all over the place in, uh, in Yosemite. They don't care about you particularly. They see so many people every day and they're, they grow up with you that they just go on about their business. Uh, but you can look at the mule deer off to the left here. There's a little uh, look at the Merced River. And then uh, again, more waterfalls. There's Upper Yosemite Falls, Bridal Veil Falls. Uh, these are the year-round falls that always are going through there. And uh, it's hard to find a more beautiful place than Yosemite. But if you go to Muir Woods outside of San Francisco, you'll see some beauty that is a little different than Yosemite. Although Yosemite does have Mariposa Grove, which is redwood trees. These redwood trees are called coastal redwoods. They're uh, Sequoia Semperverans and they are among the highest trees in the world. In fact, the, the tallest redwood tree and the tallest tree in the world is a coastal redwood tree. And uh, it is about 380 feet tall. It's a little bit north of Muir Woods and they won't tell you exactly what tree it is because people being people, somebody will want to go in there and cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> how old how long does it take for a tree to grow that tall phil uh a coastal redwood tree can live to be 2200 years old as far as they've been able to measure uh sometimes the bark on them gets to be about a foot thick uh that's one of the reasons why they live so long you, we all know about the california wildfires but the insulation of that bark resists the heat of a wildfire and so although you will see some of the redwood trees are burned out at the base, they're still alive and they're still growing. So, uh, yeah, they, they will get over 300 feet tall. And as you can see, you can go through Muir Woods on a boardwalk. And that's what they encourage you to do. So you don't have to worry about, you know, slipping on leaves or, you know, hitting a root with your toe, stubbing your toe on a root that's, that's stuck out. But you'll learn a lot about these magnificent trees that used to be all over the West Coast. They would they went all the way from like Monterey up into Oregon. Uh, and they were at one time uh, over in Europe. Also, there are none of them left, but uh, they were they were international trees. Now the only ones left are the ones in Northern California. This is old growth. When San Francisco was being built and uh, a lot of the other communities, the Victorian houses were all framed in redwood because it resists insects. You know, it's a very good building wood. It, uh, it doesn't, it's not affected by water or rot. That's why you build your deck out of redwoods. Uh, but most of, in fact, all the Victorians in San Francisco uh, 
built by the early pioneers who got out there were made out of redwood. And this is one of the only groves left until you get up to far northern California and, and Redwood National Park. It's a beautiful place. Going into Muir Woods is like going into a cathedral. You have that same spiritual feeling when you go into Muir Woods. South Dakota, we're going to go back to the middle of the United States now. South Dakota's got a couple of very interesting national parks, and one of them, just like Mesa Verde, is dedicated to the works of man, and that is Mount Rushmore. And uh, everybody, I think, knows this iconic picture, this view of the presidents. It's actually unfinished. Um, they never really finished uh, with the lapels and the coats and all that sort of thing, which was part of the original design. But when you see it, it is very, very impressive. And there's a loop, a walk that goes down. It's a paved loop called President's Loop, goes down from the visitor center right to the bottom of the mountain. So you can get lots of different views and photographs of, uh, of Mount Rushmore. And they also do a very nice uh, little pageant every evening at night, uh, which is a, a very patriotic salute to the presidents and to the, to, the, to the country. Completely different national park, yet it's only about a 45 minute drive from Mount Rushmore is Badlands. And Badlands was, deposit, was deposits just like you see further west in the United States. And you can see all the different colors of stratification. Uh, a lot of that is just mineral deposits that have oxidized with exposure to the air. Um, and you know what happens to iron and what happens to steel when it uh, oxidizes? It turns to rust and it turns red and different metals oxidize different ways. And so when you take a look at this, you can see the straight lines of how the sediments were laid down at different times, at different periods of time. And erosion has given us this beautiful landscape of the Badlands. Uh, this is very close to Rapid City, although you feel like you're on the moon when you get to the Badlands. Uh, but you, the drive through the park is absolutely stunning. And as you get up into the higher elevations, you'll also start seeing a little of the wildlife. They have their own big horn sheep out here. And there are herds of sheep that go through here. And uh, of course, you know, every national park in the West is going to have its share of reptiles and its share of everything else. But uh, the big mammals are really interesting to see because they're so unique and you just don't see them anywhere else. Wow, that really just seems so breathtaking. Thank you so much, Phil, for walking us through all these parks. You really brought these up to the top of my bucket list. So I, I mean, this has gotten me so excited to want to travel. You know what uh, people tend to do, I think, a lot of people who are travelers, they tend to say, well, I'm going to go to see Europe first, and then I'm going to go, maybe I'll go to China. And then they put off the national parks until it's way too late to do a lot of hiking or climbing or anything like that. I would say don't waste any time. Get into the national parks as soon as you can, because the more, uh, the more stamina you've got, the more mobility, the more you'll be able to enjoy. So exactly. don't wait. Yes, and you don't need to wait because we are running them right now, as I said. So I'm going to just talk through quickly some of the different options that we have. So if you want to see a lot of the parks, um, our U.S. National Parks, the Grand Canyon to Yellowstone Tour is a great choice for you. It's a 12-day itinerary, and this is going to hit a lot of those bigger parks we spoke about, like Mesa Verde, the Grand Canyon, Zion, um, getting to see Yellowstone. You know, this is a great itinerary. If you're wanting to spend a few fewer days in the parks, we do have two different options. Um, we have one that's our U.S. National Parks, the Rockies to Yellowstone. This is a nine-day tour, and this is focusing more on some of the southern states, so getting to see Colorado, so Rocky Mountain, um, going to Arches in, in Utah, um, getting to also see Yellowstone, you know, Grand Teton in Wyoming with an opportunity to go to the Badlands and, and Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Or if you want to hit some of those more northern states, we also have our Grand Canyon to Zion, or actually this is the southern one. Sorry, I 
I, I got it backwards. <laughs> this is the Southern state. So it's also nine days and this is going to go more Grand Canyon, getting to see Sedona as well, which is beautiful. Bryce Canyon, Zion, they're awesome trips. And as we had mentioned earlier, we do also have our new adventure tour um, to the national parks. So we'd love to introduce that. So if you are looking for some more hands-on, culturally immersive, um, more opportunities to do hiking and things like that, definitely check out this one. It's very similar to the one that we just saw. So seeing Sedona, Bryce Canyon, Zion, the Grand Canyon, but just a nice week in the Southwest to really immerse yourself directly into this, these beauty, this beautiful, you know, scenery and everything. So yes, um, and we'd love to have you join us, but we're going to move into a time of some questions and answers, Phil. So I just want to transition us into that. Um, we had one question that came in um, from Armini that I thought was very helpful, um, talking kind of about the average time on buses, you know, going between these different locations on tour. So what is kind of that average transfer time that travelers should expect? Boy, an average time is going to vary from tour to tour and from location to location. Um, but I would say that the longest time you could expect to be on uh, on the bus during a regular during a regular uh, itinerary would be about four hours with a break in between. So you know we don't we we don't like to keep you on the bus longer than about an hour and a half hour and forty five minutes. Uh, then we'll stop someplace and we'll take a break. We'll do a stretch, and uh, you have to understand that. If, for example, the the national parks tour that I've been doing for fifteen years. That's 2,400 miles from beginning to end, and that's without the extension. <laughs> so you're going to be covering some beautiful landscapes, but even as you're traveling on the bus, you're going to be looking out the window at an ever-changing, gorgeous landscape wherever we go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be very interesting, and I know that most of the tour directors, I certainly do, we have some uh, videos that we can put on that are educational, that have to do with the area where we are, that will keep your attention. And I've even known people to nap. <laughs> a great time to do it. Yeah, that's what I always do when I'm on Absolutely. our tours. But I feel like if I was doing the national parks, there's so much to see that I probably wouldn't want to sleep. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, we have another question that had come in from Kathy, um, you know, for our travelers who are interested in learning more about Native American history, are, are there certain destinations specifically that would be best for travelers to want to add to their bucket list? Yeah, the southwestern United States, mm -hmm. uh, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Utah, there's a lot of history there and there's a lot of Indian culture there. Uh, New Mexico specifically, where I live, we have kind of an equal balance of three different cultures because the we have the indigenous culture, the Puebloan culture, and some uh, uh, Apaches are, are here as well, and so, well, Mescalero and Hickoria Apaches, and Anglos, like myself, and then the Spanish that came in from Spain into Mexico and then up from Mexico into uh, New Mexico. Those three cultures are almost equally represented here. And the same is true in uh, places in Arizona and Southern Utah. They're very much involved with indigenous people culture. So you will see a lot of the handicraft of the Indians and in where, where we stop. And when I say Indian, I'm not being disrespectful in New Mexico indigenous people call themselves Indians. It's just the way it works. Uh, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful by saying that, but the various cultures are very, very well represented in the Southwest mm -hmm. to this day. In fact, I just saw on the news last night, uh, a hot flash here, that there is a movement by the indigenous people to reclaim the national parks. Mm -hmm. And they want to manage them. So they're saying, hey, that was our land in the first place. So that is how active an Indian culture we have out here. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll if you're if you if you want to see more of it and learn firsthand what it was like, definitely the southwestern United States. 
that's great. Oh, thank you. And then we have time for one more question. Um, we were hearing from Christine, you know, in terms of like, I know we're spending some time on the bus. How do we handle like seat rotation or seat assignment on tours usually for on the bus? Seat rotation has just been a given. I mean, we would always say everybody we're going to do take yourself, find yourself a seat and then we're going to rotate. And I would always do it like three seats clockwise. During time of COVID, it's it's going to be very common not to do seat rotation for a while, uh, just because if you make yourself a little nest, then you, you can be safe in that nest. You're not going to be following anybody who might have exposed themselves to something. And so uh, these days, there isn't a seat rotation unless the tour director decides that he's they're going to do that. But that will probably continue for a while. And a lot of these questions, because of the COVID situation that we have on our hands, it changes from day to day and week to week. So uh, whatever I tell you is true today. <laughs> Yeah, and that and that's another great, you know, we're my yeah. team here, the Traveler Sport team. That's a great resource for us. We're we're are, we're a great resource for you. I mean, that we're we're happy to answer any questions that travelers have as we're getting closer about what it looks like specifically on um, your trip because as Phil said, things can change from day to day. That's but right. Yeah, again, I just wanted to say thank you, Phil, for joining us today. Um, if you guys loved this webinar, we are or well, first off, if you love this webinar and you would like to join us at one of the national parks, feel free to reach out. We would love to have you. Some stop, spots are filling up for the summer, but if you're interested in these national parks we talked about or even Alaska, we even have some in Hawaii too. We are happy to have you join us. Um, we're also doing these travel talks every week and next week we have the wonderful opportunity to be joined by our president, Heidi, and our VP of operations, David Evans. And so um, if you'd like to learn, get some more of your questions about travel coming for moving forward answered this is a great time to come also we're doing some world war history ones and some canadian rockies moving forward too so feel free to visit our website um go ahead tours.com webinars and we would love to have you join us but again thank you phil so much for joining us today i can't wait to get to the national parks you really put that travel lust in me um, <laughs> we are i can't I wait to join you on tour someday <laughs> Judging from the sound of your voice, I don't think it's too hard to get you to excited about traveling. <laughs> I do love travel <laughs> and we are, we're thankful for you. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a wonderful evening.